Thanks, Joe. What's wrong with pop psychology? Come on, let's have some of that too. Sometimes I think we get so caught up with our tools and our technologies that it's easy to forget that at the other end of this thing we're designing, whether it's a website or an app or a medical device, is a person who needs or wants to use it. And if you're designing for people, then you better understand the psychology of people. And if you do understand the psychology of people, then you can design more engaging products. So that's the topic of our talk this afternoon. And I want to start off with a little quiz. So do not reach in your pocket or your purse for any money. Um, these are uh, 12 different possible pennies. Only one of them is really what a penny looks like in terms of the way the head is facing and what it says and where the writing is. So I want you to look at these and see, can you figure out which one is the real penny versus the fakes? So why don't you shout out, what do you think? What? K? What did A? K? I? E? J? Someone says none of them are, right? A. A is the real penny, and the rest are not. Okay, so why did I start with this? What does this have to do with psychology, and what does this have to do with design? Well, for those of you who are from the US, how many times have you actually looked at a penny, right? Probably dozens, hundreds, thousands, right? A lot of times you've looked at a penny, and yet very few people are ever sure which one is the real penny. How can this be? Well, this is because of one of the 10 things I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna talk about 10 different uh, uh, items that have to do with designing for engagement. We're gonna start with number 10 and we're gonna go down to number one. And so number 10 is people actually think and want to think as little as possible. And we do something um, which psychologists call gating out, right? So we only notice what's salient. We only notice what's important. And what's important about a penny? I mean, when you are, these days, not much, right? Sometimes they say we should just do away with pennies altogether. But any coin, um, even when you're in a, a foreign country and you're using a coin you might not be used to, you know, what is the characteristic of the coin that makes it important? The value, but how do you even know which coin you're holding? Size, color, right? You're not reading, although sometimes, and I, I've been on like a, a train, you know, and try, trying to read. Does that say 50 pence? What does that say, right? If you don't know the coin, but most of us for coins we're familiar with, we don't pay attention to what's on it. We just pay attention to what's salient, and that's color and size. And that's probably not even something, that's not like a rule someone had to teach you. That's not what you had to memorize, right? This is just what you developed over time. So what we know about humans is that they want to do as little work as possible, right? They will do as little work as possible, not because they're lazy, but because that is efficient. And then you're probably all familiar with Steve Krug's book, you know, Don't Make Me Think, right? Along the similar lines. We don't want to think, we don't want to uh, do anything that uses up our brain glucose. So when we are faced with websites or any kind of product where there's just all this stuff and all this text, and this is a lot of very dense text about um, art in uh, Central America, it's, you know, the question always is, who's going to read that, right? If this was designed for someone with a PhD in art history, they're probably not gonna be at this website reading it anyway, right? And if it's designed for someone who doesn't have a degree in art history, they wouldn't understand what it's saying. So don't ask people to do too much. Don't ask them to work, don't ask them to think. Which brings us to number nine, which is we really only have about 10 minutes. Okay, maybe you can stretch it to 20 minutes of thinking time available before you use up all the glucose in the brain and you need a break, and you probably also need a snack, which means I'm in a lot of trouble right now because this talk is gonna go for more than 10 minutes, right? Now, and you just had lunch, so I know you're at the high glucose level. Uh, so we're gonna try and you know, stretch that as much as we can, but actually people need a break. I was giving a talk, actually talking about art history, to a, a uh, consortium of museum directors about a year and a half ago in Vienna, and, and I was talking about the museum experience. 
right? And any of you who've ever been in an art museum, I don't know if you have the same experience I have, which is about 10 minutes into the experience, I'm exhausted, you know? I'm mentally exhausted, I'm physically exhausted, I wanna go take a little break. And uh, I, I know I went to a museum once with my daughter and she has a degree in art history. And even after 10 minutes, she was like, okay, that's good. You know? <laughs> it's like, we just got here. Well, let's go down to the gift shop. You know? Let's go to the cafe. So I was telling the museum directors that you, know, you can't expect people to go through your museum for four hours without a break. And this one museum director did not like this idea. And he was pounding on the table. It is our job to educate them. They will stay for two hours. They will learn, you know? And I'm like, okay, okay. No one ever got so excited about anything I was saying as that guy did. But we know that people only have a short amount of time, so don't make them think too much. Now, this brings me to Daniel Kahneman. How many of you know Daniel, Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow? Yeah, some of you do. Wonderful, wonderful book. And we're gonna talk about this idea in uh, even more detail at, at the session after this on how to get people to do stuff. But I want to introduce it here because it has to do with thinking. So if you, you know, there's a, there's a multiplication problem, 17 times 24, and I'm going to ask you to try doing that right now without pen and paper, just in your, in your head. Try multiplying 17 times 24. Okay, I can tell some of you have already given up. You're, you're not, I, I'm just going to stare at it and pretend that I'm Thank you. Right. I, I'm not going to make you do it all the way. But that's an example. Well, actually, let's contrast that. I asked you to multiply those two numbers with this. I want you to tell me, what are you looking at? What do you see? There's a little boy. He looks sad, right? So think about the qualitative difference in your thought process between those two things, right? This one was fast, easy, intuitive, didn't hurt much, right? And that's an example of what Kahneman calls system one thinking. Fast, easy, intuitive, compared to that multiplication problem, which was an example of system two thinking, which is hard, effortful. This is the stuff that really uses up the brain glucose, right? The quick, intuitive stuff doesn't use it up as much. So what we have to understand about people is that they wander around most of the time in system one thinking, okay? They wander around in that intuitive mode. Look at the penny. Don't even look at the penny, right? It's copper colored, it's this size, okay, it's worth one cent. So when we are designing stuff, we have to understand people are not, you know, we put all this energy into it and we really, I mean, we just, you know, think about do we want this font, do we want it over here and how much text are we gonna put? And they're, want, they're doing like, oh, I don't know, do I even wanna be here, you know? That system one thinking. Gotta understand that's the mode that most people are in. Which brings us to the next item, which is most mental processing is unconscious. So I think some of the most exciting work coming out of psychology, and I have a PhD in psychology, that's my background. The most exciting work has been in the last 10, 15 years with the research on unconscious mental processing. We now know that most mental processing occurs unconsciously under the surface, which is actually a real problem for those of us who are in the design field. And you know, there's a lot of sessions here today on doing user research, and I've been doing user research for more years than I care to admit to. Uh, and yet I begin to wonder now about some of the user research that we do, because when we ask people, you know, what do you think and what would you do, how do you feel, that's conscious, and that's not what's really going on. And what we know what people do, if you ask them a question, especially about how do you feel about this, uh, they will give you, or why did you make that decision? Why did you decide to buy that TV? They will tell you the reason, and it'll make a lot of sense, and it'll be pretty you know, rational, but that's not really why they did it at all. They don't even know. Okay? We don't even understand why we do most of what we do. All right, I have a memory test for you. So if you have paper and pen, uh, even just a scratch piece of paper, that's the best. If you don't, you, know, you could write your answers down on a... Laptop, I guess, but it's going to be a little tougher. So get out paper and pen. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to flash a bunch of letters in front of you, and your job is to memorize them. All right? And I'm only going to give them to you for a few seconds, and I'm going to take them away. And then, after I take them away, I'm going to make you wait five seconds. I'll count out five seconds, and then I want you to write down the letters that you see in the order you see them. So that's your job. Memorize, but don't write until I tell you to. 
And we're going to do this three times. Okay, here's the first one. You ready? Okay, don't write yet. Okay, now you can write. Write down the letters you saw in the order you saw them. Okay, we're going to do it again. Same thing. I'm going to show you some letters. Don't write until I say to. Here's the second set. Okay, not yet. Okay, now. Okay, then here's the third set, last time. Again, don't write till I tell you to write. Okay, not yet. Okay, now. Six, five, three, four, nine, two, one, five. What's wrong? Okay, let's see how you did. Let's see, let's go all the way back to the first set. How many of you got all those right? Anybody? No, not quite. Okay, how many of you got all of those right? No, a lot of you did. You do realize that this, these letters are the very exact same as these letters, right? But they're chunked differently. All right, how many of you got the numbers all right? If you raise your hand, I know you're lying. <laughs> All right, so which one of these was the hardest? The, the last one? And, and so why was one of those easy and the rest of them hard? Any ideas? First, so first of all, chunking. If the chunks were meaningful, right, if you recognize that it said CIA, IBM, FBI, iPod, HP, then, then how many things are you remembering here? Five. But if you don't recognize the chunks, then you're, then you're memorizing, you know, if, if, you, if you tried to chunk that, but it didn't really have any meaning, so it probably didn't help you much. I mean, they were chunked, but not in a meaningful way. So we know about human memory that it's very fragile, and that you can only remember things for a few seconds unless you can put it into what's called long-term memory storage. And with an exercise like this, you can't put it into long-term memory storage. What made it hard about the numbers, by the way? I was distracting you by saying other numbers, and if you want the fancy term for that, we call that memory interference. So now you can go back to the office and say, oh, I think we have memory interference going on here, and you'll go, ooh. So what we know about human memory is that it's very fragile. How many people have heard this, people can remember seven plus or minus two things? Okay, that is not true. Just thought I'd explode that myth. It's really interesting, this is all over the internet everywhere, you'll just find all, it's, it's actually, the research does not bear this out. This is from a 1956 paper written by um, uh, a man who gave a talk at a, the American Psychological Association conference. And he was positing the theory that there might be a limit to human memory and actually to human information processing in general. And he thought that limit might be seven plus or minus two, five to nine things. But actually later research has shown very, very clearly that the number is more like three to four. So people can only remember three to four things at a time. People can only deal with three to four things at a time. If you ask them to make a decision amongst seven, eight, nine things, they're really just going to pick a few and make a decision amongst those. And maybe then they'll take that number one top and maybe they'll compare that to a few more things, but maybe not. So three to four is really about all you have. And uh, I love um, Sheena Iyengar's research you may have heard of. She did research with jars of jam. She would set up. Uh, a table with jars of jam in a grocery store for people to try different varieties of jam, different flavors. And sometimes she had six jars of jam on the table, and sometimes she had 24. So I have two questions for you. How many of you think that, uh, how, many, how many, which table uh, brought more people in to try, when there were six jars or when there were 24? How many people say more people would stop with six jars? And how many people would say more people would stop with 24? Ah. More people stopped when there were 24 jars, 24. But the, the rest of you who said six, you're answering the next question, really, which is, which way did people buy more jam? 
when they were six. And here's what the numbers are. 60% of the people stopped to taste when they were 24 jars of jam, 40% when they were six. But look at how many people purchased. So many, many more people purchased when there were only six jars than when there were 24. So what we know is that people like having choice. But if you give them too many choices, then they, they don't know what to choose. So if you give them, this is a website, and it's got like, you know, a whole page of things, and then there are, there's like all these different ones to choose, and people are just going to go, ah, I don't know what to do. Choice equals control equals survival. This is our old brain talking. I want to have a lot of choices because I think if I have a lot of choices, then I have control, and I think if I have control, I'm going to survive. It's actually the old brain unconsciously ruling all of this. How many of you have ever worked with a client, and you're doing a design, and you know, you say, well, on this page, how many different you know, product items should we show? Oh, all of them. <laughs> show all of them. It's like, well, yeah, but that, you, know, you have like 35, and you know, you know, no, all of them. You know, we want to see all of them. Because uh, people say they want a lot of choice, but they can't choose if you give them too many options. And we also know that people are more motivated by fear of loss than they are by anticipation of gain. So messages of scarcity, uh, afraid of losing out, is extremely motivating. And that's also the old brain. All right. Uh, something entirely different now has to do with vision. So uh, Larson and Lashke were interested in studying peripheral vision versus central vision. So uh, just to clarify, if I'm looking straight at this uh, person who had the misfortune to be standing right in front of me, so now I'm staring at him, that's central vision, okay? Now, if I'm looking at him, and I want everyone else in the room to like wave your arms up and down. Yeah, I can see you doing that, even though I'm looking right at him. That's peripheral vision. So Larson and Olashke were interested in the role of central vision versus peripheral vision. And what they did was they took pictures of rooms, and they sometimes grayed out the outer area and left the central area, and sometimes they grayed out the central area and left um, a ring of outer area. And they did this very scientifically, making sure that each time the same percentage of the picture was available, et cetera. And the question was, they showed them living room and dining room, and, and they wanted to know, could people, which way did people more accurately identify the room they were looking at, and which way was fastest? And what they found surprised them, because what they found was that people more quickly and more accurately identified the room when the central vision was grayed out and all they could see was the periphery. And they came up with this idea, they labeled this, um, uh, the contributions of central versus peripheral vision to scene gist recognition. And what they're saying is that people use peripheral vision to get the gist of the scene, to decide where am I, right? Uh, and I find this interesting, how many of you have ever participated in or done an eye tracking study? Yeah, this is where I get into a lot of trouble because I think that it, I think, you know, what does eye tracking measure? Central vision, only central vision. And it's not measuring periphery. So just because someone did not look at something with their central vision does not mean that they did not perceive it. Does not mean that it doesn't have an effect. And in fact, the research shows us that we are more sensitive to images of danger in our peripheral vision than in our central vision. So, so peripheral vision gets in. Don't think, because they, I mean, it's the refrigerator effect, right? How many of you ever opened the refrigerator and stood in front of it and said, where's the ketchup? And then, you know, your spouse comes up behind you and says, you're looking right at it. And sure enough, it's right there. Just because you see something doesn't mean you didn't pay, you paid attention to it. Vision and attention, two different things. So little warning about that. All right, people use the peripheral vision to get the gist. And I think, you know, we have this tendency these days when we're doing websites to, you know, leave a lot of white space on the periphery because we're trying to make sure things adjust because we don't know what device people are looking at it on. But we're losing. We're losing valuable real estate if you put stuff in that periphery, especially if you put stuff in the periphery that has anything to do with danger or loss, it will definitely get in. All right, number four, the fusiform facial area. There's a special part of the brain dedicated to processing faces. 
It's active as young as six hours old. Newborn babies six hours old show this tendency to uh, pay attention and prefer human faces. So it's, the assumption is it's born into us. Special part of the brain outside even the visual cortex. It's actually a part of the brain that's deep in the midbrain where social information is processed. It's right next to the amygdala where social and emotional information is processed. Um, and what's also interesting, by the way, is that people who have autism, the connection between the FFA, this is going to be on the final, pay attention. <laughs> oh, there is no final, I forgot. Um, you know, I taught college for a semester just uh, a year ago, and you know, I got to say, this is going to be on the final, and really mean it, it was fun. Okay, so um, the fusiform facial area is connected to the amygdala. So our, our attention to faces also contains a social emotional component. But people with autism don't have that connection. So they, rec they pay attention to faces, they recognize who the face is, but they cannot read the emotional content of the face. That connection is not there. But for most people who don't have autism, faces grab attention and they contain emotional information, especially if the face is head on straight on looking into the camera. If it's too much of an, uh, in a profile, then the visual cortex will see it, but the fusiform facial area will not pick it up and recognize it, particularly as a face. Uh, don't do this. <laughs> this is one of my clients, and they, you know, they had this, I, they, I don't know why they did this. You know, they fused two faces together. So the fusiform facial area looks at this and goes, creepy. Right? So you don't want to do that. Number three, uh, speaker and listener brains sync up. So one of the interesting things we know about brain research um, through some recent studies is if you take someone, well, what we know is that I'm speaking right now and you're listening, and if we had me hooked up to an fMRI machine and we had you guys all hooked up, which would be really expensive and we're not going to do, what we would find, though, is that as I'm talking and I have a certain pattern of brain activity, your brain activity would be synced up with mine about a, a half of a second apart because it takes that long for me to talk and for you to hear and then interpret. Our brains are actually synced together if you are hearing my voice. Not true if you are reading text I have written, right? which is one reason I am such a big advocate for audio and for video communication in addition to or in place of text information because it contains emotional content and it causes that brain sinking in a way that text alone does not. Very, very powerful if people can hear your voice. All right, another uh, little activity, more paper and pen. You got paper and pencil ready? I, again, I have three things. There's no right or wrong answer to this. Um, this is a, a faucet. We'll say you checked into a hotel here in Seattle and these are the faucets. And you, your job is to turn the faucet so that medium warm, lukewarm water will come out of the faucet. So I want you to just write down a little drawing. How would you turn this hot and cold faucet handle to make medium warm, not too cold, not too hot, just medium warm water come out of the faucet? So make a little note about that. Okay, and here's another question I have. We'll go back over these after we do them. Uh, I have a, a, a little red needle there, which um, I should really change the color of because for those of you who are colorblind, that looks kind of gray. Uh, but I have a red or a gray needle uh, in there, and I want you to turn that dial. See that the circle in the middle? That's a dial, and you can either turn it A, which is counterclockwise, or B, which is clockwise. And I want you to turn it so that that red needle goes towards this wall over here. Okay, it goes towards this wall over here. So decide whether you're going to turn it A, counterclockwise, or B, clockwise. And write that down. You want the red needle to move towards that wall. Okay, and here's the last one. I have a circle. It's divided into four quadrants. And I want you to label the quadrants A, B, C, D, whatever way you think makes the most sense. Label the quadrants A, B, C, D. Now we're going to um, go back and we're going to see how everybody answered. And what I want you to do, so we can see how much variability there is, 
um, or how much variability, variability there isn't. I want you to, when I say how many of you did this, raise your hand and hold it up for a second and then look around the room and we'll see how people voted. Okay, so for the faucets, how many of you said you would turn them both to the right clockwise? How many, all right, look around. We have a fair number of votes for that. Okay, how about turning them this way, both to the outside? Look around, fair number of votes for that, maybe not as much as the last one. How about this, turning them both to the inside? Again, hands up. Ooh, not too many on that, okay. And how about this one, both to the left counterclockwise? Okay, a lot of votes for that. All right, so a fair amount of variability on that one. Let's uh, look at the next one. How many of you said that you would turn the needle A counterclockwise? Okay, a few of you did. I can see some hands over here. I don't know if I'm going to, nobody's raising a hand, I don't know. All right, and then can I presume how many of you said B? Okay, so not as much variability on that. More people said B. And then how about this one? How many of you labeled your quadrants this way? Okay, that has a fair number of votes. How about this way? Oh, very few votes, maybe two. Uh, you two should get together and talk after. <laughs> We want to talk about your brain wiring. No, just kidding. How about this way? Oh, a lot of votes for that. And then how about this way? Okay, and a fair number of votes for that. All right, why did I make you do this? Right. Um, what happens when we design is we, design, we sit down and we're designing something, and we say, oh, yeah, 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 that'd be good. That's a good way to do it. That makes sense. Okay? Very dangerous. Right? As you can see, there's a lot of variability on some of these. I mean, there wasn't a lot of variability on moving the needle, but even a couple of people said they were going to move that needle counterclockwise. And I'm sure some of you are like, yeah, right. You wouldn't move the needle. Why could you? No, no, no. Of course you'd label the quadrants this way. What are you talking about? You'd turn the faucet this way. What kind of, what, who are, who's in this room anyway, right? Because what, when it feels right to us, we think that's the way everybody else is going to react, and that's not the way everybody else is going to react. And you guys know this as designers, right? This is why we have to test with our target audiences. But it's so easy to, to just forget that and feel, okay, yeah, this would be good. I have another question for you. This requires a little bit more braveness on some people's part. How many of you are uh, 25 or under? Raise your hand and let's look around the room here. A smattering. How many of you are 55 and older? That's the brave part. A smattering. How many of you are in between those two ages? Yeah. Look at that. You guys are the Gen Xers. So I give this talk all around the world, and I get there's a little bit of variability, in, in, but it is very, to this kind of audience, very similar to what we see in age ranges. Age ranges. Why do we care? Well, most of the people designing most of the stuff are Generation X, just like in this room. And yet, did you know, we all know the baby boomers is, is huge population, right? Gen Xers, you hate the baby boomers. They're using up all the money, right? You know this. <laughs> you know there's a lot of them compared to you. Gen X, small, small demographic. Did you know that that 25 and under, the millennials, and now even we have the newer generation coming up, did you know that they are a larger demographic than the baby boomers? Yeah. There's more millennials than there are baby boomers. So you guys small group, you're doing all the design for many more people. They're not like you. There's research that shows that we imprint on technology when we are from the ages of 8 to 12. Whatever technology is dominant during that age range when we are 8 to 12, forever colors our expectation of what technology is and how it should work for the rest of our lives. So these assumptions you're making about what is good and what works and what makes sense, you are making those partially from a generational viewpoint that won't work for the baby boomers and won't work for the millennials and won't work for the generation that's coming up behind the millennials. But it'll color it. Now think about this. What was the dominant technology when you guys were 8 to 12 years old? What? Video game, Video game consoles? VCRs? Right? Uh, uh, may, at some point, you know, computers, but not, you know, the, like the computers we have now. What about for the baby boomers? What was the dominant technology when they were 8 to 12 years old? TV. TV. Uh, telephones that hung on the wall, that were connected with a cord, that you picked up and dialed, you know? 
Uh, how about the uh, millennials? Eight to 12? Smartphones, maybe, maybe starting, definitely laptops, right? But maybe not tablets, not when they were eight to 12, right? So you can, so think about the expectation, you know, baby boomers, um, uh, ads appear on TV, ads not supposed to appear on computer, right? No, ads on TV and radio, that's where ads are, right? Millennials, of course ads are on the computer, <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? Ads are everywhere. What are ads? Even just the way people talk about things. Um, you can hear uh, a baby boomer will say, I'm going to go on the internet. You know, like they actually have to go somewhere, you know, and now they were, now I'm on, right? But the, our language, our terminology is different. So your expectations, you got to be really careful because what you're, des you're designing, unless you're just designing for Generation Xers, you're designing for many, many more people and they don't necessarily think like you. Okay, so that brings us to number two. People have mental models about how technology is supposed to work. And that's what all of our UX research is all about, is trying to understand that's what user-centered design is all about, trying to understand what are the mental models of our target audience so we can design for them. What generation are they in? What expectations do they have? All right, last one. People expect technology to follow human-to-human -human rules. So Carl is sitting up here in the front, and if I walk up to Carl and he says, hey, Susan, how are you doing? And I do this. You know, that's not okay, right? I just violated some unspoken rules about human-human communication. I'm supposed to respond to him. I'm supposed to say, I'm doing great, Carl, right? Way back in 1996, Byron Reeves and Clifford Nass wrote this book, The Media Equation, How People Treat Computers, Television, and New Media Like Real People and Places. It, it was actually a really insightful book, but it didn't, this idea that our technology would interact with us as though according to the same rules we have for human-human interaction. That was a foreign idea in 1996. Now it's commonplace, right? It's, it, we expect our technology to give us feedback and to be understandable, but you know, back, way back when, we didn't have that expectation. But I think we still fail a lot at this. So I was at a website and uh, is for car stereos. And there was a little thing that said, would you like help deciding on a car stereo? And I said, yeah, that would be good. So I come here and it says, a car stereo is the central part of any car audio system. Oh, <laughs> well, I didn't know that. You know, thank goodness they told me that. Uh, also known as a radio. It's like, who's writing this, right? Who is writing this stuff still? This is from my local library website in Wisconsin. All the items in this bib, bib are bookable. Book a copy of this bib from the full bib page. <laughs> it's kind of like Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. You know, there's no librarian in the world that would say that if you walked up to him or her. Right? This is not following the rules of human to human uh, discussion. Okay, phone number field should not contain dashes. Okay, so I walk up to you. And you hand me, I say, can I get your number? I'll call you later. You hand me the number and I look at it and I go, oh God. And I crumple it up and throw away. You use dashes. <laughs> Start all over, please. Right? So it knows that it's dashes. But it's still going to make you enter it again. I like this one. <laughs> this error should not occur. But it did, right? All right, my favorite one though is from a client of mine in Texas. They would have a system crash and it would come up and it would say, shut her down, Henry, she's spewing up mud. <laughs> like, okay. Guess you gotta be from Texas to get that one, All right? So we, we need to communicate as though we are humans because us, we, are, we designers are humans. All right, so if you're gonna apply this, all this stuff, five critical steps. Uh, you got to know about people in general. You got to understand the psychology of people if you're going to design. Then you have to know about your particular audience. What generation are they in? What mental models do they have? What expectations do they have? 
Then you have to know what's the one target action that your audience wants to take with at this point, on this screen, on this part of the device, in this part of the task that they're doing, what's the one thing they want to do right now and make sure you design for that one thing. What's the one target action you want them to take? Not necessarily the same thing. That's a big problem. You have to identify what are the places where we want them to click on this button and register, but they have no interest in that. You know, they want to do something different. So what's the one action you want them to take? How can you reconcile the, any differences between those two? And then apply these principles of psychology to design that way. And really, you know, I mean, it's five simple steps. There's a lot more in it. But that's really what we're doing when we design for engagement, when we design for people. Uh, I, uh, if you want more information, I have a bunch of books. Um, the one that applies most to this is, uh, I can't even see my own books from this angle. 100 Things Every Designer Needs to, I think it's this one, Needs to Know About People is the one that would apply most to what we're talking about here. And Joe mentioned, I think someone won, uh, no, someone won uh, a free seat in any of these courses. But there's an online video course designed for engagement. And also, if you do want to, have, to know more in March, I'm teaching a one-day course on this in the great city of Chicago. Creativity is allowing yourself to make mistakes, but design is knowing which ones to keep. And I know you guys are all designers, and you will do a great job in knowing which mistakes to keep. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I believe we are on break. Um, Joe? Uh, yet we have a 20-minute uh, break. We'll come back, and then we'll be in three separate rooms uh, for 90-minute uh, extended workshop sessions. And I'll be up here if people have questions. Please just come up and ask.